Hello guys, welcome to day two of our 25 day prayer and fasting. I hope all is well. God is good and I am very excited about day two. And so I hope you are as well. My name is Tiffany and this is the year of the bride fast where we, uh, thousands of us all over the world get together and come into agreement with the word of the Lord that this is the year of the bride, both for God's ecclesia, his church in preparing the bride to meet her bridegroom, and also for the preparation of supernatural marriages where God is joining man and woman together um, in holy matrimony for the purpose of uh, whatever God is calling these two people to do in agreement on one accord in earth as it already is in heaven. If you want all of the details of this fast, please go to www.coveredbygod.co. Again, that is coveredbygod.co into your name, email address, and check your inbox and your spam folder for your email. Um, I also did a video called the most frequently asked questions for the year of the bride fast. And so when we're done with this video, make sure you go back and watch that one because it gives you the who, what, where, when, and why it answers all of your questions. So you should not have any more for me um, because I like to just get straight into what we're doing today. Also, because we'll be together for the next 25 days, every single day, you should absolutely subscribe to my YouTube channel because why not? And I also think that you should take this share link and text it to at least seven of your closest people, right? Like it's always fun when you join together and come into agreement with stuff like this. It's very powerful. And also don't fall behind, you know, like make sure you stay on top of all of the days and don't fall behind because you end up having to catch up watching more than one video at a time. And, um, and so it's just easier to kind of just keep going at this rate. So yesterday we dealt with bloodline, um, repentance because you should never start a fast without repenting first. Repentance is a very powerful warfare tool against the kingdom of hell. And uh, repentance is not about your tears. It's not about you crying. Repentance, God doesn't care about your emotional manipulation. Repentance is all about turning from the sin, right? And so that's like if you're on the way to somebody's house, you know what I'm saying, getting ready to lay it low and spread it wide, you stop midway and you go back home, right? R repentance is you completely turning away from the sin that you were getting ready to do. And so that's what true repentance is. And we just repented on behalf of our bloodline. Now, there were many people that were like, Tiffany, if God is not punishing us for what our ancestors did, why are we, why are we repenting? And my thing is, y'all do what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? I have done enough studying in this word. Um, and I have done enough to for me to say, you know what? It doesn't hurt for me to say, you know what, God, I stand in the gap. For all of these people I never even met that represented the bloodline that you gave me. And I'm going to stand in the gap and I'm going to say, I repent. I repent for war, um, the molestation, incest, bestiality, homosexuality, lesbianism that they did. I repent for the black magic and white magic. I repent for the spells that they casted on other people. I repent for the shedding of innocent blood by murder. I repent for all of the abortions on the bloodline where all of these babies are now crying out from the grave against us. I repent, okay? I don't think it's no harm in saying sorry for what somebody else did. I just don't. As a matter of fact, you often hear a lot of stories of how, you know, um, maybe somebody's father died 10 years ago, didn't know they had a completely different family and they go to the children of the father that never met them and they stand in proxy of their father and say, I repent on behalf of my father for what he did to you. And you will learn that it brings a lot of healing to a family. So do you have to repent for what somebody else did? Of course not. Do I think it's dumb not to? Of course I do. Cause it doesn't hurt, right? To stand in the gap for an entire bloodline that you know polluted the pulpit, desecrated God's altar, completely slapped him in the face over and over and over again, completely gave God their butt to kiss over and over and over again, always went back to another God to worship them. I don't think there's any harm in going back to your father and saying, I stand in the gap 
for the breach of contract that my bloodline did over and over and over again against you. Father, take my apology. I didn't know anything about it and really didn't learn nothing about this till the latter half of my life. But I want to say I'm sorry for what they did. And I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, that you are the God that will not hold me responsible for what somebody else did against me. I thank you for your grace and your mercy, God, that even when I decided to break the evil covenant that my father uh, erected or my mother erected, that the enemy is looking for payment for the breach of contract and the blood of Jesus Christ sealed that contract for me. So I thank you, God, that the blood answers my ransom and there is no breach of contract because you settled it for me. There is no harm in doing that. So again, you all can do what you want to do. You know, I, we tend to have many different denominations and many different perceptions of God, but there is only one, right? There, there's only, there's not many different denominations and there's not many different perceptions and there's not many different anything about God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just because we're in this year doesn't mean that God changes his mind, right? God's God is the same at all times. And so, you know, um, just keep that in mind. So yesterday we dealt with bloodline repentance. And as a matter of fact, I, do, I personally doesn't, don't think it hurts to repent every single day for the next 25 days. There is a book that I shared with you all called Generational Prayers by a man named Paul Cox. I'll show you the um, the cover of this book once again. This is the cover of the book. It's called Generational Prayers by Paul Cox. Um, I have the 2020 edition and apparently that one is out of print, but I did buy last night the 2022 edition to make sure that it was the same. And it's pretty much the same with just a few added prayers. That is a full book of repentance. So it doesn't help for you to take three of them a day and start off your morning with, with three of these prayers every single day. And if you don't have access to the book and you're not able to get the book, the Bible is really all that you need, right? Our books that we're reading are great supplements, or in other words, vitamins and minerals to the full course meal that is the Bible. But the Bible is really all that you need. And if you go to D Daniel chapter nine, um, he prays a very powerful prayer of, uh, of generational repentance, national repentance, global repentance, personal repentance, um, that I think that you need. You don't even need a book, you know? So Daniel chapter nine is great for you if you can't get access to this or you just also wanna pray in addition to this. But this book is fire because it is a full book of prayers on repentance. It is a full book of prayers on repentance. Somebody say, can you please pray for me to be free of paranoia and anxiety? Well, guess what? This is what this fast is all about, right? When you're done with this, you should have no fear and anxiety. The Bible says that fear and anxiety is actually a spirit. He says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but I've given you power, love, and a sound mind. So what we do know is that fear is a demonic spirit it is also a stronghold, which means that you have not done your due diligence when that spirit of fear has come upon you to cast down every vain imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? The knowledge of God is anything that the Bible says that it is. And so if you're not standing on guard like a soldier in front of a castle, that every time a fiery dart, which is a spirit of fear, anxiety, or panic attacks come to hit you, and you're not immediately casting down that vain imagination that's trying to exalt itself against what you know about God and what he said about you, of course, you're going to be riddled with now the stronghold of fear and anxiety. Anytime you don't really catch this stuff at the beginning, it becomes a stronghold. And so this is what this is all about, right? You, it's, you, it's about you repenting for allowing um, this thing to set root in you. It's about repenting for coming into agreement with it. It's about repenting for not studying the Bible and not doing what God laid it out what to do. He said, cast it down. And we didn't do that, right? It's about now making, now we end up worshiping worry, right? More than we worship God. And so there's so many things that happens when you don't do what the Bible says, which is to immediately cast down this vain imagination and say, I rebuke this spirit of fear. I repent God for whatever I did today that opened up the spirit to fear. Maybe you were scrolling on social media and you saw something happen to somebody and immediately it opened up the door to the spirit of fear, but you wasn't supposed to be on social media anyway, because God told you to um, fast or pray or read your Bible between six and eight. And you just happened to sneak on social media and looked at it, but he wanted 
wanted you to stay away from that time for a specific reason. So you want to repent for it. Then you want to renounce it and say, God, I seem to have come in agreement with this. I, I seem to have made a covenant with the spirit of fear. So I break every evil covenant with the spirit of fear. I renounce my agreement with it. I come out of agreement with anxiety. Father, any movie I've watched, any conversation I had, anything I watched on social media that happened to somebody else, any addiction I have to the news and all the bad news is showing me all day, every day that is now open up a door to the spirit of fear. Because remember, we talked about it yesterday. When you open up a door, you don't get a say of what comes through that door, right? And if you are watching these things, if your body or your eye gates and ear gates are wide open to these conversations and what's happening to everybody, then you have opened up a door and fear has slid its way straight in there. And so you repent for it. You renounce it. You come out of agreement with it. Exactly. Job is a great example. He said the thing that he feared the most came upon him. This is why you want to be vigilant against the spirit of fear. And, you know, we have these um, new age sayings like feel the fear and do it anyway, but that's not what the Bible says. And Romans 3, 4, the Bible says, let God be true and every man be a liar, which means that yes, it is a popular saying, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway, but it is not a God saying. God said, I haven't given you this spirit of fear. So you shouldn't be feeling it and doing it anyway. You're supposed to kill it because I didn't give it to you. If God didn't give it to you, it came from hell. Okay. That's just what it is. And so you want to make sure that you repent, you renounce, and then you just begin to declare over your life. I have power, love, and a sound mind in the name of Jesus. According to Isaiah 7, 7, it shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. According to Psalms 91, Tiffany, because Tiffany dwells in the secret place of the most high God, she abides under the shadow of the almighty. A thousand may fall at her side, 10,000 at her right hand, but no evil will come near her dwelling. God has given her the angels charge over Tiffany that I won't even dash my foot up against the stone. You have to find scriptures that come into agreement with God, got your back, and he don't play about you, okay? Okay. He's a wall of fire round about me and glory in my midst. You touch me, you touch in the apple of God's eye. He's going to take you on up out of here. So you have to start to repent, renounce, and then replace what the voice of fear is saying to you with the word of God. There's also something y'all called, and I'm going to get to today's point, but I think that this is important. There's also something called a rehearsing spirit, right? And so fear, as you know, has a voice that comes with it. Fear has a voice that comes with it. It begins to whisper to you. You close your eyes at night. You can't get any rest because fear is talking to you. And so that's when you want to begin. The Bible says in Hebrews that the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. You want to start taking the blood of Jesus Christ and silencing the, 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 um, the, the voice of fear in your mind. And you also have three places in your body where memory is stored, right? It's stored. It's lodged in your brain, it's lodged in your heart, and it's lodged in your GI tract, okay? It's lodged in your brain, it's lodged in your heart, and it's lodged in your GI tract. You often hear those stories um, about open heart transplants where there's somebody that passed away, maybe through a motorcycle accident or something, and their heart is now given to somebody else that needed a heart transplant. And all of a sudden, this person has a love for violin. And their family is like, they never loved violin before. What's going on? And the family of the dead person says, oh my gosh, Timmy really loved violin and nobody knew it. It was just a secret thing that he loved to do. That's because memory is stored in your heart. In that case, you want to begin to um, command and all memory recall in your mind, all memory recall in your heart, and all memory recall in your GI tract. What is your GI tract? It is your gut. And they call it your second immune system. This is when you somebody says somebody's name that you haven't forgiven or they betrayed you or something like that, and you lose your appetite, right? Why? Because your gut has a memory sensor in there and it reacts to any emotional trauma that you're dealing with. And so you want to begin to pray that the memory recall call comes out of your mind, comes out of your heart, and comes out of your GI tract in the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you also have the spirit of fear, anxiety, and panic attack that is hereditary. And so a lot of the times you didn't open up the door for it, but while you were pregnant, your mother was filled with the spirit of fear. And of course that feeds into you. There's a scripture and um, I'll look for it right now, maybe because I don't like giving y'all scripture without giving you proof. But the Bible says, he said, in the day of my nativity, my cord was not cut. 
in the day of thy nativity, my core. Okay, it's Ezekiel 16, 4. He says, as for thy nativity, in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut. And so if you were in a womb and it was filled with the spirit of fear and you have not cut that spirit, spiritual umbilical cord from that bloodline, then you are still feed, you are still being fed from that familiar spirit that you were in the womb from, from your parent. This, the, the spiritual world y'all is very real and it is very, very, very dangerous. If you don't know, that's why the Bible says my people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. Again, it says that my people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. The Bible says my people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. So due to you not understanding Understanding this stuff, you are still struggling for something that happened to you in the womb and you don't know anything about it. Add that to your prayer point for today that you begin to break every spiritual umbilical cord from your mother's bloodline, from your father's bloodline, and you are only attached to the umbilical cord of Jesus Christ, right? And there is nothing on either side of the family that will come to you because you're not even with them no more. You, you are aligned with the bloodline of Jesus Christ, okay? So that's Ezekiel 16, chapter 4. As an as for thy nativity in the day that I was born, thy navel was not cut. Okay. And so you want to make sure that you begin to cut the navel cord in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's go into our teaching. Uh, today we are going to kill all idolatry, right? Death to idolatry and um, it's going to be good. Now, some of these lives will be an hour and a half, two hours. Some will be 10, 20 minutes. Some will be 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It just depends. I don't intend on keeping you um, unnecessarily at all. And also one other thing, I thought that I was going to be able to email you out the scriptures after every single video. However, I don't want to start something that I can't finish off and I am pretty busy. I'm not going to be able to do that. And I also thought about it. I don't want to have to study for the message, pray about the message, give the message and then email y'all the message when I'm done. What is there left for you to do if I do all of that? And I also think that I'm taking away from you uh, one of the most powerful parts of studying a scripture, which is to listen to it again and write it down for yourself. There's something very powerful when you actually listen to the video like a good student with a paper and pen and a notebook and you write down every scripture and you write down what you're learning from the scripture, you actually tend to retain it a lot better. And so I don't want to take that away from you at all. I want to make sure that you learn how to be great students like I am. And, um, and I'm not always handicapping you by doing all of the work for you just because I don't think it's fair for me. And it's definitely not fair for you. So what is idolatry? We'll start off with this, that what infidelity and adultery is to a marriage is what idolatry is to God. Very simple. So that should make everybody understand what idolatry is. What infidelity and adultery is to a marriage is what idolatry is to God. At the very root of our Christianity and our relationship with God is the fact that we are now in a marriage, right? With our father, we're in a marriage with God. And God is a very jealous God who is not okay with you serving other gods or being in relationship with other gods or worshiping other gods or bowing down to other gods. Now, how God created us was to worship. That is our nature. That is what he called us to do. That is what he created us for. You know, we are created to worship. And at all times, you are either worshiping an idol or you're worshiping God. There is no in between. So even if you feel like atheists don't believe in God or anything of that nature, because God created us to worship, at all times, we are either worshiping God or an idol. There is absolutely no in between. Even people that have been in church 40, 50 years, you'd be surprised the most savedest grandmoms and aunties and mamas that you know are either worshiping God or an idol. And a lot of the times people turn ministry into an idol, their man or woman of God into an idol and things of that nature. So inf what infidelity and adultery is to a marriage, because you as a woman will not like if your husband is cheating on you, you as a man is going to feel some type of way if your wife cheated on you. Well, guess what? God is even more jealous than that. He does not want his creation to bow down and serve the creatures that he created, right? As a matter of fact, I think it's in Romans 1 25. It said it turned the truth of God into a lie and served the creation rather than the creator. 
Uh, let me make sure I got that right. Romans 125, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And so we have that all the time. We have people that worship horoscopes and you may say, well, Tiffany, there's God does zodiac signs. You are lying. Okay. God did not call you to go around calling yourself a cancer. God did not call you to go around identifying yourself with an Aquarius, a Libra or a Virgo. God did not call you to do that because now what you're doing is that you're going to the, the star for your answer when you were only supposed to go to the Holy Ghost, right? And so we tend to, you got crystals and people are like, well, crystals are God's creation, not when you're charging them up for healing, they're not, okay? And so you wanna make sure that you're not taking the creation that God created and making it into an idol, or in other words, the thing that's gonna answer your questions because you have now put that in place of the Holy Ghost and God. So keep that in mind. So what is idolatry? Just like you don't wanna be cheated on, God doesn't want to be cheated on. So let's stop cheating on him. God does, God is not interested in playing your side trick. So um, in scriptural terms, if you go to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to read just three through five, Exodus chapter 20, verse three through, uh, yeah, verses three through five, thou shall have no other gods before me, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in earth below or that is in the water under the earth. Verse five, you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Okay, it's very simple. You shall not have any other gods. Now, if you're anything like me, you're like, well, how does this apply to me? Because I definitely don't have any other gods, right? I don't have a graven image in my house. Uh, I don't have anything in my house that is a representative. But if you have a picture of that white Jesus in your house with the blonde hair and the blue eyes, that's an image because nobody knows what he looked like. That is a graven image. Most of you in your, many of you in your house, I won't say most of you, but many of you in your house have, um, Buddha pictures in your house. You have sound bowls in your house. You have things of that nature in your house. Those are graven images to a God that you are now bowing down to. You should not have any of that stuff as decoration or decor in your house. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Angel statues and things of that nature. You guys, this is bad. This is bad. Somebody said, John, let me look at John 2030, 2023. Um, these things are bad. Those are graven images and the likeness of God. Those Jesus pieces that y'all, them chains y'all like to wear, it is that. You cannot do it. I'll have to study that and see what that means because I don't know what it means off the top of my head. Catholicism is not, it, there's only one way to God and that's through his son, Jesus Christ. Catholicism is not okay. Catholicism should never be worshiping Mary. Like, so Catholicism is bad. Catholicism is bad. I don't know about a cross, guys. I'm just telling you graven images. All I know is stop wearing your Jesus pieces. Stop wearing your Jesus pieces. Somebody asked about a Christmas tree. Yeah, I guess if you're bowing down to your Christmas tree, you're worshiping it and you're serving it, you probably shouldn't have one. Um, if you guys have anything that you're bowing down to, including slobbing on somebody knob that you're not married to, you probably should not um, be involved with that because that's bowing down to a God as well. It's called fornication. It's idolatry. And so if you're bowing down, you know, doing a Gok 360, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> somebody should be doing the got got 360 on baby okay you probably need to come get them up off your knees princess princess get them on up off your knees and stop giving that man the got got 360 you know what i'm saying so that's all i'm gonna say about that but i believe that that's also called bowing down to and worshiping you know what i'm saying something you should not be bowing down to and worshiping um my favorite definition of the word idolatry, you know, I'll be coming on here saying to myself, I'm going to be on my best behavior 
And it just, I can never happen. Never, I never end a video on my best behavior. But that one was good because y'all know what I'm talking about. Half y'all on here fornicating anyway. But that's why God is just washing you with his blood. And he's like, come on, princess, get on up off your knees. Okay, let's get up. Let's go. So my favorite definition of idolatry is anything that you love more than your obedience to God. I want you to write that down. Idolatry in its most simplest form is anything that you love more than your obedience to God. Idolatry is anything that you love more than your obedience to God. And one other thing about idolatry that I think is absolutely fascinating is gifts also become gods. And so there's a gift that God may have given you that can easily turn into a God, lowercase g. And so we always want to be very cautious about that as well. But for the sake of today's live, I want you to write down in your journal. Come closer. I don't have my glasses on. Stop. <laughs> Make sure you get your journal. Go to coveredbygod.co and go to the shop. And get your journal, but I want you to write that idolatry is anything that you love more than your obedience to God, okay? So that will help you. And the reason why God hates idolatry so much is because it is the one thing that causes men to forget about God. That's what idolatry is. It's the one thing that causes men to completely forget about God. And it's also something that obviously mocks God because it's trying to take God's place and um, it's trying to give you, it just takes God's place. God is not interested in anybody taking his glory. And um, yeah, that's it. Waste beads are also wrong. You guys, okay, let me not get distracted. Let me finish my teaching and then I'll, ask, I'll answer questions at the end if I can, okay? So um, God hates idolatry because it makes men forget about God. Um, it is an abomination. It, it's a mockery to God and he just doesn't like it. Okay. So let's just stop doing it. Um, if you make an idol, if you sacrifice or worship any idols, you are actually an enemy to God. And so we're going to go through some examples of what an idol is so that you know, but I just want you to know that if you make something an idol, social media, uh, procrastination, you know, many things can be made into an idol. If you start worshiping it, you can worship worry, you know, you have become an enemy to God. And our covenant that we've made with God, the new covenant does not allow for you to enter into any other covenant. The new covenant does not allow for you to enter into any other covenant. Okay. So a lot of people, I want you to go to Psalm 16, four. Psalms 16, verse four, the Bible says, and their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer nor take up their names into my lips. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. And so idolatry multiplies your sorrow. What is sorrow? It is pain. It is hurt. It is wound. It is injury. I want you to take a look at your life right now and see how much pain from that man you was just with that broke your heart, that woman you were just with that broke your heart, how much hurt and wound and injury. As a matter of fact, a great example of idolatry are ministries. There are many people because again, we are created to worship that God has put you in a ministry and you have turned the man or woman of God into an idol. You turned a ministry into an idol. And the second they really make you upset, you then become super injured and you're full of pain and full of hurt and, and very full of woundedness. Why? Because your idolatry scheduled you for a life full of sorrow. Okay. That's just what it is. People right now have walked away from God because a man or woman hurt their feelings because they made them a God. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And so the Bible promises that your sorrows will be multiplied if you serve or follow any other God. Let's just be very clear. Um, it also invokes the wrath of the blood sacrifices offered by us and our ancestors, which are crying out for vengeance. So not only does your idolatry or your worshiping other gods, lowercase g, multiply the sorrow in your life, 
right? It also does something about invoking the blood that's crying out for vengeance against you. Go with me to Genesis chapter four, and we're going to start at verse 10. And he said, what have you done? This is God talking to Cain. What have you done? Let me go up a little bit. Verse eight says, Cain talked with his brother Abel and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel and killed him. Verse nine said, um, and the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Verse 10, he said, what have you done? Because your, the voice of your brother cries out unto me from the ground. And now, of course, you're cursed from the earth, which, which hath opened up her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. What does this mean? This means that even when you have something like an abortion, right, which is the murder or the blood sacrifice of a child to the demon named Moloch, that baby's blood is still crying out against you from the blood, from, from the ground. That baby's blood is still crying out against you from the blood, from the ground, sorry. So anytime you have idolatry, what you're doing is not only are you multiplying your sorrows, but it's also invoking the wrath of that baby's blood from the ground that's crying out from, for vengeance against you. Now you may say, Tiffany, this is Old Testament, blah, 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 whoop de whoop as if the Old Testament has been negated and it has not. Y'all gonna get in trouble with God trying to discredit the Old Testament because if that's the case, I want y'all to stop reading Psalms 91, stop covering your kids with Psalms 91, stop declaring Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Like you can't pick and choose which parts of the Old Testament you're gonna use because it's beneficial to you and it's not right and so the beautiful thing about the old testament is it tells you hey this curse of inflammation this curse of emroids which is really cancer because it's a tumor which cannot be cured all of this happened because you served other gods but there is a way to stop this thing right which is to repent for idolatry to turn from your wicked ways and the bible says in hebrews chapter 12 verse 24 and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so here you have the blood of Abel that's crying out from the ground against you in vengeance. And the Bible says, when you repent, he makes it as if it never happened. You are justified and justified is just as I've never done it. Isn't that beautiful? Write that down. You are now justified because of the blood, just as I've never done it. Okay. And the Bible lets us know, according to Hebrews 12, this is why if the Old Testament didn't matter, he would have never put Abel in this scripture in Hebrews 12, 24, where he says, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, because the blood of Abel was crying out vengeance against his murderer. And so the blood of Jesus Christ silence the voice of that accusation because the Bible lets us know that the devil, our adversary, is always going around trying to find an accusation against us, but it is the blood of Jesus Christ that silences the voice of that accusation. It silences the voice of those abortions that you had. It silences the voice of any murder on your bloodline that that blood is still crying out against you. As a matter of fact, thank you, Holy Ghost, for this example. Um, Reverend James Solomon, who is the author, Fortune! Oh, they gonna still have. Um, Reverend James Solomon, who is the author of the Deliverance from Demonic Covenants and Curses, told me a story one day. And he said there was this family that he was working with that all of them were blind. Either they were blind or they were close to blind and basically had bifocals on from the child, the babies to the oldest. And he's like, obviously, this is a curse. And after one of the members of the family became a member of his church, you know, and they got into the revelation of what all of this stuff was about, they were like, hey, can you come meet with my family? Because my grandfather is still alive. I believe he was like 100 years old, but he was still in his right mind and he still had the ability to talk and he remembered everything. So Reverend James Solomon went to these people's house and the guy called all of his family over. So everybody in the family was over and the grandfather told a story, you guys, that nobody in the family ever knew. And this story was, I believe they lived in um, America at the time, but this story was that this grandfather who's a who's 100 years old now was one day seven years old. 
and he was walking with his father in Nigeria and they had just built a beautiful Nigeria, right? It wasn't messy. It wasn't dirty. It was a very beautiful Nigeria. And um, there were some beggars in town and there were um, the father, you know, yelled at them to get away. Excuse me. If you don't get away, I'm going to like, you know, get away from here. But there were two beggars that, that were on skateboards and they were blind. And the father yelled at them to get away and said, if you don't get away, I'm going to shoot you into the lagoon. Like I'm going to pick you up and throw you over this bridge into the lagoon. And they were like, please just give us some time. You know, they were on this skateboard or this roller thing. They couldn't move as fast as the father wanted them to move. But the father dealt with the spirit of rage, anger, and murder. And the father picked up the first blind man and threw him over the bridge. Okay. The seven-year-old is watching this who is now a hundred years old. The second one um, gets picked up by the father to get thrown into the lagoon. And before he, before he dies, he says, um, I, I'm, uh, he said, I curse your whole family and everybody will be filled with blindness. I curse your whole family and everybody will be filled with blindness. I curse your whole family and everybody will be filled with blindness. Well, obviously we know that God, um, obviously we know that God really loves, um, beggars. He loves poor people. And so from that moment on, it was a curse that was on that, the blood of that man that cried out against that family. There was a curse on that man that the, his blood, his vengeance cried out against that entire family, okay? And the whole family suffered from the curse of that blind man until they got the revelation of repentance for the innocent bloodshed and renouncing the evil covenant of blindness, right? And then um, coming into new covenant with God and giving him rule, reign, and dominion over their bloodline. And guess what? The curse of blindness ended in Jesus' name. Now, some of you may say, well, Tiffany, I feel really um, disadvantaged because my I come from a family of idol worshipers. You know, a lot of these people here come from families that are you know, saved a little bit, but I come from a family full of idol worshiper and I want you to be encouraged because there was a man named at Abraham that also came from a family of idol worship. There was a man named Abraham that came from a family full of idol worship. As a matter of fact, Abraham's father, his name was Terah, and he was not just an idol worshiper, but he was also an idol maker. He had a store. He was an entrepreneur. And in his store, he sold and made with his own hands idols for everybody to worship. Okay. And so I want you to be encouraged and you shouldn't feel no type of way about coming from a bloodline of idol worshipers because Abraham um, was the son of an idol worshiper. And look what God did with him. Gideon was the son of an idol worshiper. Look what God did with him. And so, you know, that should be the least of your concerns. Now, a few things, cause you can find more about, um, G G um, what, what's that man's name? Father in Genesis 11, Abraham's father. And one thing that you'll notice is very powerful is when you look at their children early on, you'll notice that they started having children very early. So in verse 12, you, you see Arphazad lived five and 30 years and begat Salah, right? Like you see these people had children at a very early age with context, you know, they lived to be like 500 years old, right? With context, they leave, they live to be about 500 years old. So keep that in mind. Um, but when you read Genesis chapter 11, you realize that, you know, Ebar had his baby at 30, 40, 30 years old, 34 years old. Somebody else had their baby at 30 years old. Somebody else had their baby at 30 years old. Somebody else had their baby at, you know, 29 years old. And here we get to Tara and Tara has his baby at 70 years old, right? So you'll notice that idolatry, you'll notice that idolatry 
caused a delay in Tara's life. Y'all can pronounce his name however you want to. I'm not a school teacher or English teacher. I do the best I can, okay? I'll be signing these names out. It, mama named him Tara. I'm going to call him Terry. He's spelt like a Tara. I'm going to call him, call him Tara. It might be Tara. It might be Taharzi. I don't know what it is. I'm doing the best I can. Verse 26, and Tara lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahar, and Haran, okay? So you'll. I want you to ask yourself, why all these people? And then you get to Tara. And you realize he had it at 70 years old. And then you'll notice that they all had their children at an old age as well. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest lessons we learned from Abraham's life is that he didn't even know, uh, he couldn't even have children, right? That was due to idolatry. And so when you look up the definition of the word Terah, it means delay, but it also means station, it also means stationed. This is a man that was stationed in one place, okay? It also means station. It means a stopping place, a halt. It means... Bye. It means a stopping place and it means a halt. Very powerful when you actually study it, okay? And um, I want to take you to Ezekiel 14 really quickly. Ezekiel 14 very quickly, verses 4 through 6, because idolatry can also be something that's in your heart, okay? Um, Ezekiel 14, we'll start at verse Ezekiel 14, we'll start at verse three, son of man, these men have set up in their, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Verse four, therefore speak unto them. Now he did this to these people because they put an idol in their heart, which means that now this idol has become a stumbling block before God. And he says in verse four, therefore speak unto them because they have this idol in their heart and say, thus saith the Lord, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to a prophet. Hey, prophet, do you have a word of the Lord for me? Prophesy all of that stuff. That's idolatry in your heart. Now, God, what he promised was when you go to this prophet, I, the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. So when you go to a false prophet, because you already have idolatry in your heart, he said, I am going to answer you according to the multitude of your idolatry. This is why many of you say, oh, God told me who my husband was. And now you're getting all these confirmations. Do you know there's something called confirmation idolatry where you no longer trust God anymore, but you need him to show you every step of the way because you don't even trust him anymore. There, what faith is, is if, I, if confirmation doesn't come, will you still believe me? The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 3, there won't be any wind and there won't be any rain, but I'm going to make this valley full of ditches. This is but a light thing for me to do. Will you believe God if you saw, if God promised you rain tomorrow and the sun was shining bright, blue skies, no cloud in sight, no wind, no rain, no nothing, but he promised you a well full of water that would come out of the sky, would you still believe him if he gave you no confirmation? And so for some of us, um, confirm, idolatry of confirmation is a thing. And what he's saying here is, I'm going to answer you according to the multitude of your heart, which means that you're going to get a steady stream of idolatry confirmations, but they're not from me. They're from, they're from hell. But everywhere you you look, it's going to, oh, that's confirmation. I must be the right. There was a man I knew and there was, a, there was at least 10 to 12 women who didn't know each other, but they kept coming to me. I don't know whether for prayer or counsel. And they kept saying that this same man was their husband, right? These were women of God. These were praying women, y'all. These were not women out in the world. And I'm like either nine out of 10 of these women are wrong or 10 out of 10 of them are wrong. And 
I thought it was so powerful because it was a great example of these women were having dreams that this man was their husband. These women had already made up their marriage in their mind to this man because they were sure God said it. A few of these women were prophetesses. Some of, some of them were intercessors. Some of them were women of God, you know, and I thought how powerful that the enemy is able to steal their minds because of idolatry and continuously give them confirmation idolatry. This is why yesterday somebody emailed me and she goes, well, if I hear God, why, if I heard God say somebody was my husband, why would I not put the person's name in the journal that you told us to write in? Because, you know, I heard God and I said, with all due respect, I don't know you. And in order for me to judge whether you heard God or not, I would have to ask him about you, but I'm never going to take somebody's word just because they said they heard God. Like I got to judge the matter. And from the history that God's told me, I have seen lots of women being bewitched by thinking that they heard God saying somebody was their husband and that man was not their husband. And so I'm not saying it's for you, but what I am saying is for the sake of your heart being full of idolatry and we're not sure about that. I said, don't write anybody's name in your book. Don't put nobody's name nowhere. Just say my husband. I think that's a safe place until we make sure that the residue of idolatry is out of your heart, out of your mind, out of your soul. And your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions and we're just kind of giving God a, a empty palette to paint with, an empty canvas to, to paint with, okay? And so let's just keep that in mind that just because somebody say God said, don't mean God said, baby. You understand? I judge everything and I don't know you. I don't care about you. And if I knew you, I'm still judging what you said if you said God said. Do you understand me? Baby, that's a tricky word, God said, because I understand how confirmation works when it lines up with the idolatry of your heart. Do you understand me? Was he a warlock? I believe so. And I believe that you would agree with me if you knew who he was. And have, I would say 99.999% of y'all know who, who, who he was. Anyway. What are some examples of idols or idolatry? Um, obviously, number one, anything that you love more than your obedience to God. Anything that you love more than your obedience to God. I want you to write down right now a list of idols that you can think of. What have you loved more than your obedience to God? Number one, social media. Especially if you look at the time, your screen time right now, and it absolutely does not line up with your scripture reading time, your Bible studying time, your prayer time, or anything of that nature. Social media <coughs> should never, ever, ever... Um, overtake your time with God, it has become an idol. Okay. Anything that you love more than your obedience to God, procrastination can become an idol to you. Procrastination can become a God that comforts you. Right. And so sleep can become idolatry. Food absolutely is idolatry. I want you to look around your house and I want you to see what kind of house decor do you have in your house that is idolatry. Right. A Buddha um, uh, statue outside of your house or inside of your house is idolatry. Sound bowls in your house as decoration, idolatry. Garlands with the beads on it, idolatry because it comes from the Tibetan religion. Dream catchers, absolutely trying to figure out why your dreams ain't acting right. You got a whole religious artifact in your house catching your dreams, right? That's dangerous. Um, sage as decoration or you're using it. That's idolatry. Cultural art. I am, I, I go to Africa all the time. I will, I have to speak in Ghana this week and, um, y'all, I wouldn't dare bring nothing to my house. Now everything is not evil and everything is not a demon, but my God, most of it is. Okay. Let's just be clear. And so you want to be careful about the stuff that you're bringing into your house. Sorority paraphernalia is an idol and idol worship. Freemasonry stuff in your house is idol worship. Um, like I said, the cancer symbols and signs, the ribbons, uh, the Coleman stuff are, is idolatry that you have in your house. And you know, as a symbol, all of that stuff is idolatry. Sports is idolatry, basketball, football, all of that stuff. Anything that you love more than your obedience to God, that stuff becomes idol worship for sure. And again, um, some of this stuff is not like sleep, obviously you need sleep, but there's a way you do it that becomes idol worship, right? It's a way you do it. Ministry, 
is good, but there's a way you do ministry that becomes idol worship. It becomes idol worship. Okay. It, you start walking away from God and you just start going through the motions of it and worshiping the idol stuff and things of that nature. Absolutely. Watch out for thrift stores, all of that stuff. There's a book. I know I don't probably got y'all to read a million books at this point, but since we're here, y'all, this I read this book like four times a year. And I'm going to just share it with you because it's so freaking good. Many of you have already seen this book because I've already told you to read it. But it's called Unbroken Curses by Rebecca Brown. Um, please, guys, I'm not interested in you putting in any of the other titles of her books because I'm not talking about those books. And so please refrain from saying, oh, you got to read this book too. That's not what this is about. And I would like for everybody to stay focused and not distracted and on one accord to make sure that we're reading these books for a certain purpose. Now, the reason I have listed this book for you all to read is because this book is very powerful to give you real world examples of how like a family went to Korea, brought home a painting, all hell broke loose. Husband started cheating on her, couldn't figure out what was going on. Find out that the painting is from a geisha, a geisha, whatever it's called, which were prostitutes back in the 1930s. And it released a spirit over the house, okay? Or an artifact coming back from Mexico or something like that. This is what's powerful about this book. I, I, I read it often. I travel out of the country a lot. And so I tend to try to go through this book before I travel just to retain the information. And one thing that was very powerful about this book, you guys, is that I had to go to Belize last year. And um, I remember just going through the book and one of my best friends, she was like, hey, you know, do you want to uh, sow into the, uh, the entrepreneurs in Belize, like the women entrepreneurs who are working, you know, who are just single moms and struggling? Would you like to sow into the women entrepreneurs? And immediately I got a check in my spirit and the Holy Ghost said, absolutely no, 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 no. Now you have to understand how weird that is for me because I'm an entrepreneur, right? And I also love my moms who are doing their best to make ends meet for their families. Why would God tell me to say no to sowing into these women in a different country? Well, I get to Belize. I go to the market to see where they are. And every single thing that they're selling is idol worship. They are giving you this and saying, this is for love. If you want more love, this is for money. If you need more money, you want to buy this artifact. If you want more love, if you want him to love you, this is his artifact. And I was just in the market like, thank you, Jesus. And I was with a girl and, you know, everybody don't know me, but I was, I pulled her to the side. I said, Hey, don't get nothing in this market. It's all witchcraft. And God didn't want me to sow into that. So that was very powerful. You know, um, children can be an idol, right? Anything that you love more than your obedience to God, you can make children idol worship. Obviously you have mother son relationships that are very incestuous. Even if she's never had sex with her son, that's when women, you marry a mama's boy and this, this mom has not let go of her son. And now she's mad at you because you took her husband away. You know, that woman has made her son an idol and she's in trouble with God for that. Okay. Same vice, vice versa with fathers and daughters and things of that nature. Uh, we're supposed to have a beautiful, loving relationship with our children, but it's never supposed to be idolatrous. Yes, you can have idol worship with your husband or wife, or you can make marriage an idol for sure, because you don't want to love something more than you love God. And so there is a healthy way to want to desire something that you know God promised you. And there's a very unhealthy way to desire something when your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions are not healed, right? Of course, daughter and mother relationships can be very idolatrous. Um, the giftings that God gave you can easily turn into an idol. Um, that's like if you're a singer, if you're an actress, if any kind of gifting that God gave you can absolutely, absolutely turn into an idol. That's why you see so many perverted. I don't know what Jack and Jill is, except for Jack and Jill went down a hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. So y'all keep saying Jack and Jill. Is it the Jack and Jill bathrooms y'all are talking about? I literally have no idea what Jack and Jill is except for the nursery rhyme. Okay. Somebody fill me in. Cause I now is it bathroom, Jack and Jill bathrooms. Is that idolatrous? I don't know. The, the nursery rhyme, I'm not sure, but I just don't know what it is, child. I'm not sure what y'all talking about no more. Friends can be idol worship, right? If you consider going, oh, okay. They're okay. 
Thank you guys so much for letting me know what Jack and Jill is. Because I was like, Lord, the nursery rhyme is idolatry. It might be. It's a black elite group for children. Yes. Idolatrous. Thank you for letting me know. Get your kids up out of these sororities and fraternities. It is bad. Okay. All bad. Your friendship groups can be idolatrous. If you find that every time something happens, you're going to them before you go to God idolatry. Now I do know some people that have idolatry towards their city and the city that they live in and the city that they come up in, you know, they tend to like go rock for their city in a very unnatural idolatrous way. And so keep that in mind as well. Um, you coveting what somebody has is idolatry, right? Worshiping angels, worshiping elephants. I thrift is not wrong. The issue is you don't know what's attached to what you just bought right? You don't know what's attached to what you just bought. Can you do me a favor and just read this book for me? It's going to answer all of your questions and it's going to have you looking twice about buying stuff from out of the country and bringing it into your house. Y'all, this stuff is a lot more dangerous than you can ever imagine, okay? And so um, your man and woman of God can become an idol. Uh, horoscopes obviously is an idol. Uh, procrastination can become an idol. And just ask yourself, what is my replacement for, the, for my comforter? The comforter is given to you by God and he is the Holy Spirit. For a lot of people, weed is a comforter, right? And isn't it funny that weed is also smoke, right? It's the pneuma, it's, it's pneuma and so is the Holy Spirit. It's the pneuma of God, it's the breath of God, it's the wind of God. And we tend to take the smoke and replace it with God, replace it with the Holy Spirit. And so now we got weed that has brought us comfort. It is weed that has brought us comfort. Weed has brought us comfort. Shopping has brought us comfort. Sex has brought us comfort. Okay. All of these things has brought comfort. And so just ask yourself when I'm stressed, when you're stressed out and you have a problem, who do you go to first? Because we are expected to go to God first. We're not expected to go to weed first, sex first, pick up your phone, call old boy first. We're not expected to have a stressful day and go immediately and watch sports or you know what I'm saying, or anything of that nature, God comes first. The love of money is idolatry. Entrepreneurship can become idolatry, right? This is why he says, whenever you get what you've been asking God for, don't forget about me. Because all throughout the Bible, they begged God for the answer and then they forgot about God. He says, don't forget about me, okay? So no person no region, nothing takes the place of God. Absolutely nothing takes the place of God. All of that stuff is idol worship. And obviously with all of these descriptions and examples, you have a little bit more understanding that you probably are in some type of idol worship, especially when it says sorrow is your portion. So if you feel like you are in pain or wounded or feel injured or brokenhearted about something and it seems to be continual, I want you to ask God where idol worship is. And I heard this woman of God say this on TikTok. I thought it was wild. Okay. At first I didn't know her name, but I wanted to at least know every, I want everybody to know that I did not come up with this because I believe in prophetic integrity. I believe that it is the devil when you steal somebody's prophetic word and you act like you came up with it yourself. Um, do we have the copyright on people's words? Absolutely not. But there is something diabolical when you repeat somebody's prophetic word uh, verbatim as if you, as if you were with God and God gave you that revelation with the motive, with the wrong motive of making people think that you're more spiritual than you are. So I do believe in prophetic integrity. I hope that while you're under my tutelage, you will begin to believe in prophetic integrity. And if you did not make something up, just stop lying and saying you did. Nonetheless, I didn't know the woman of God's name, but I did announce at the last cover by God. I said, I did not make this up. I just don't know her name, but I want y'all to know I didn't come up with this. Okay. And then somebody told me her name was Tiffany Buckner. So Shout out to her for even this analogy. I was scrolling on TikTok. I caught that. I don't even know what I caught it on. Just, you know, just lazy days scrolling on TikTok. And she said that, baby, I'm about, if I had on a wig, which I don't, I would have taken it off and I would have ran around my house. She said, your reward, this is for, this is about, this, this is what I'm, what I'm going to say, is for about 98% of y'all on here. She said, your reward she said, any of you that have ever been in a narcissistic relationship, which is probably about 99.999% of people on here, anybody 
Any of y'all that have ever been in a narcissistic relationship, she said your reward for idolatry was that narcissist that you got with. Your reward for idolatry was that narcissist that you got with. She said, you want to never meet with a, you never want to date a narcissist again. You never want to marry one again. You never want to be with a narcissist again. Repent for idolatry. Stay away from it for the rest of your life. You'll never run into another narcissist, but your, your reward for serving another God, your reward for bowing down to that, give somebody the God, God 360, your reward, God paid you back with a narcissist. So those of you that keep dating men, different men, and you're like, this is a different man, but the same person. How is, you know what I'm saying? Like you tend to date the different guy and it's the same person. You date different women. You're like, you're on your 10th woman, but they're all the same somehow. How are all of these people the same and don't none of them know each other? It's because that's your reward. And you will always date a narcissist. You'll always date a narcissist until you repent for idolatry. There is a reason why God wants us to deal with this very early on in our 25 day fast, because I would say 99.999% of us on here have dated narcissists. We have been with a narcissistic man, been with a narcissistic woman trying to figure out how to break this curse. What are, what are you doing wrong? You're nice. You're loving. They don't lie. The world don't lie and told you you're an empath and you are trying to come into agreement with that, which is a new age term, baby. You're not an empath. You're an idolatrous path. That's what you are. You're in full-blown idolatry. And if you never want to meet up with a narcissist again in your life, if you want to marry a man that has no trace of narcissism in him, there is a cure for that. And your cure is to kill idolatry. It's kill it. Now, if you didn't come on here for nothing else, write that down. Go to www.coveredbygod.co. I want you to grab your notebook because once we run out of these, I'm not restocking them. Go and get you one of these and I want you to write that down in here. Your, your, your reward for idolatry, for idolizing that man, for putting that man above God is that narcissist you got because of it. That was your reward. And, and the three to five years and the 10 years, 15 years and the 20 years you wasted on that person because you wasted your time with that person and all of the damage that person did to your self-esteem, to your mind, to, to your soul, to everything about you that you felt so worthless that you were on this fast, like I'm mad at everybody except for yourself. God said, you don't want to deal with a narcissist anymore? Repent for idolatry, which is why we're here. And one more scripture I want to give you before we get into prayer and get off of here for today is 2 Corinthians chapter 16. And I just thought that this was super powerful uh, because it's something we don't talk about often. But he, um, Asa had idolatry towards physicians, right? Towards doctors. Now, obviously, God is not against doctors because Luke was a doctor, right? Um, Luke has his own book in the Bible and he was a physician. Luke was a physician, and so God is not against doctors, but we find here in the book of Asa that Asa made physicians into, into an idol. And so um, you can read this on your own, the entire, entire chapter. But what it says is, verse 12, and Asa and his 30, well, he was 39 years old. Uh, he was diseased in his foot. Until his disease was exceeding great, yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to physicians. In his disease, he did not seek God. He sought physicians. So God is not against you going to doctors. God is against when you have made doctors your God and have not consulted them. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I'm reading in verse 12, but I do want you to read the entire chapter for context. I am reading in chapter 12, but I do uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12 is where I just read that. But I do want you to read the entire chapter 16 for context. Okay. 
Um, and so how did we get deliverance? Here we are. We have some type of information. You know, our people are destroyed because we lack knowledge. And so you cannot kill what you don't see, which is why most of us have never spent time repenting for idolatry or even thinking that it was a big deal because we're like, we're not serving any graven images. It's not that serious. That's what they was doing in the book of Exodus. It don't apply to us here. And we kind of learned that it does apply to us here and God is still not with it. Right. And so how do we receive deliverance from it? One thing that is beautiful about God is how merciful he is because we are now in the new covenant and repentance is key. Repentance is a beautiful thing. And repentance is something that completely washes the sin of anything that we did away from us. Now, let me see. I wish I had some scriptures, but I don't know where my paper is from last night. So, oh, here it is. Okay. I think it's, um, yeah, let's go to Romans three. Verse 23. And that says, for all have sinned. We have all committed idolatry in some way or another, some more than others, but we have all sinned. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, what does justified mean? Justified means just as I've never done it. Okay. That is the beauty of God. He makes everything just as I've never done it. Do you understand me? Y'all better hold on to that word. Cause I like, I ain't never did nothing before in my life. He don't remember it. I don't remember it. Being justified freely by his grace. He made it just as I've never done it because of his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had sent forth to be appropriation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, what is the remission of sins? Whenever somebody is in, has cancer and they go through chemotherapy, they, when they, when the doctor says they cannot find the cancer in their body anymore, they say that the cancer has gone into remission. Okay. That means that they can't find it. It is stopped. So the same thing happens with sin. He says the blood of Jesus makes the remission of sin, which means that it stopped. It can't be found anymore. It's very powerful, very powerful. It cannot be found anymore. To declare, uh, let's see, what's, in, what's the other one? Verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified just as I've never done it by faith without the deeds of the law. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna repent for idolatry. Okay. You want to write out a list. I repent for making, I re God, first of all, I break every evil covenant I made with narcissism. I break every covenant I made with Jezebel. The Bible says, don't tolerate Jezebel. It says it in Revelations 2. Do not tele tolerate that woman Jezebel, but it's also a spirit. Jezebel is a system. It's not just a woman. It's a man. It's a system. It's in the, it's in the political system. It's in the religious church arena. Jezebel is a system. And so what he's saying is, is you shouldn't have tolerated this narcissistic spirit, which in the realm, which in the you know spiritual world, we call it Jezebel, but you should have never tolerated it. So you want to break the covenant you made with narcissism, narcissism. You want to break every evil covenant with this stuff. And then you want to repent for opening up the door and having idolatry towards any man or woman that you were dealing with, sleeping with, having sex with. Of course, that opened up the door for idolatry because when the door opens up, you don't get to say what comes through that door. You understand what I'm saying? Leviathan also is narcissism. Leviathan is a king of all pride narcissism. Do you understand me? Most people who deal with homosexuality and lesbianism, the principality that rules over them is the principality of pride, which is why it's called gay pride, right? It is Leviathan at its core. And, um, and that's just what it is. And so you want to go into full repentance. You want to begin to write down everything that we listed today that you have found to be an idol and just repent for it. Ask God to forgive you, and of course, you're forgiven, y'all. This is God we're talking about. He's a good, good father. He is a wonderful father, okay? He's a great father. He forgot about it. You are now justified, just as I've never done it, okay? The second thing you want to do is renounce. So after you repent, you want to renounce and say, God, I come out of agreement with this covenant I made with narcissism. I come out of agreement with the covenant I made with Leviathan and Jezebel. I come out of agreement with the covenant I made with this man, 
or woman, you know, I want you to go back to what you said in bed. We kind of, I kind of went over it last night when you'd be like, oh, it's yours, daddy, you know. It's yours forever. Ain't nobody else going to get this. You know, I don't. Just renounce, okay? Because you done told, you done, you done threw it out there in the realm of the spirit, baby, that well, nobody else going to get it. And that's not your husband, okay? It's yours forever. Okay, it don't belong to you no more. It's mine's and my husband's. I take that back. Okay, child, you don't know what you said during that time. You need to, and not only that, you did it during the most intimate part of covenant making. Anytime you have sex with somebody, that is you making a covenant. The rules of the Bible don't change because we're in this day and age where you think it's just you having sex. The rules don't change. Now you said those words while you were in the consummation part of a covenant being made where you have now declared that your vagina or your penis has now been covenanted with this person that you know good and well you weren't going to stay with forever. And after you renounce all of the idol worship, God, I come, I renounce it. I come out of agreement with the, with the idol of procrastination, where you told me to write this book and I have still procrastinated on it. You told me to start this business. I've still procrastinated on it. You told me, God, to go here. You told me to apologize to somebody and I procrastinated on it. Anything you love more than your obedience to God is an idol worship. Your, pro your procrastination, if you still have not done what God told you to do, is idol worship, right? It's disobedience. It's full-on rebellion at this point. And so um, you repent for it, you renounce it, and then you replace it by saying, God, I now come into the new covenant with Jesus Christ. I, 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 I believe, I, I know for sure that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. I know for sure that there is only one way to you, God, and that is through your son, Jesus Christ. And I now declare that I and me and my bloodline, my children, everything that pertains to me is now under the blood of Jesus Christ. We are covenanted with the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Excuse me. We are covenanted with the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Okay. And then you want to appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ on everything. You want to wash it away as if it never happened. And you want to just declare that the blood of Jesus Christ gives you the remission of sin, soul ties. Absolutely. When you have sex with somebody, it's, it's a tying of your soul. What is your soul? Your soul, you guys write this down, is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So if I'll give you an analogy, it's such a great analogy. Let's look at my hands as two wooden logs. These two wooden logs, super glued together. This is y'all having sex. Now, all soul ties are not sexual soul ties, and all soul ties are not bad soul ties. For the sake of this demonstration, this soul tie came into effect because of sex, and it's a bad soul tie because y'all aren't married. Now it's glued together. So now, when you decide to break up, because it's glued together, somebody has to snatch it apart. <clears throat> and now, guess what? Because this was glued together... Parts of the bark on this tree is on this one because it's glued on and parts of the bark on this tree is glued on here. And now the, your souls have been ripped from each other, but this person still has your soul and this person still has your soul. And if you read in Psalms 23, 3, it said, God restoreth my soul to me. Let's go to it. Make sure I'm telling y'all the right scripture. Psalms 23, 3 said, he restoreth my soul and he leadeth me in a path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, if your soul doesn't leave you, it wouldn't need to be restored, okay? If your soul did not leave you, it does not need to be restored. And so here he said, God restoreth my soul because there is a place where you have tied yourself to an ungodly soul tie. And when it's ripped apart, parts of your soul is still tied to that person. This is why your mind, your will, and your emotions are still tied to that event, that situation, that man, that woman, because when you got ripped apart, it's still on there and you want to begin, exactly, thank you, Tamika, it's called a fragmented soul and you want to begin to say, God, restore my soul back to me. Every fragmented piece of my soul come back to me now in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? Every fragmented piece of, of our soul. So idol worship is always, always, always defiling God's temple. Your idol worship if even if you're on social media all day and social media is an idol, it's defiling your mind, right? 
It's defiling your attention span. It's defiling your focus. You are distracted at all costs. And so um, food, obviously, can be an idol worship. Destruction of God's temple. Fornication is idol worship. Destruction of God's temple. The wages of sin are death, right? So just keep that in mind. So we want to begin to tear down the altars of your father and mother's house and the idol worship, and we'll be good to go. Day two of our fast starts on the 28th. And so we fast from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., and so I want you to make sure that you watch this live, the prayer portion of it, again at 6 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m., and make sure that you write down the scriptures that go to this so that we are on one accord concerning all of this. I am excited about prayer. Let's get started. Also, just make sure, you know, I'll start you off with a starter prayer, but I want you to make sure that you understand that, you know, God hears you. God listens to you. You know, God, you don't have to have a great vocabulary to pray to God. You just have to have a broken, a contrite heart, right? Go to God with the right motives to say, God, I've really been messing up and I've been playing you and I've been really acting as a hypocrite, but I haven't been living this out like I was supposed to live it out. And I want to repent because I've taken your grace for mercy. I've taken your grace for granted. And I felt like I was never going to get in trouble because I see all these other people doing this stuff and they, you're, not, you're not doing nothing to them. And I thought that I could do something. But what I've learned is that you don't play about me and you're very jealous over me. Okay. And so I want you to just be honest with God. Your prayer doesn't have to be perfect, but it does have to be sincere because God judges our hearts. And it does have to be, re be re repentive, which means that you need to turn from your sins. Okay. Somebody um, said, what time zones? So we fast between the hours of 6 a.m. to 3 p.m., whatever your time zone is. And we pray together the night before at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I wrote down all of the other, you know, time zones there and things of that nature. So whatever your time zone is, you do that. We are eating no food between the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And 3 p.m. We're eating no food between the hours of 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. And if you are hungry, eat before 6 a.m. and th after 3 p.m. But more importantly, make sure you're replacing your meals with the word of God because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Somebody says, what if you are married to a narcissist? Well, you want to repent to God for idol worship. Here's what I know about God. Now, I might not know much about God because he's God. You know what I'm saying? His ways are way above my ways. His thoughts are way above my thoughts. I don't even pretend to know much about God. But what I do know is that, baby, he was jealous over you, okay? This is for all my women right now that are ma and men, because women are narcissists too, that are married to a narcissist's man or a narcissist's woman. This looks like a man that is full of pride. This looks like a man that is full of manipulation. This looks like a man that is always gaslighting you or a woman gaslighting you and things of that nature. That's what this looks like, Okay. And so if you find yourself in a relationship like this, what I know for sure is that God is so jealous over his daughters or sons that he warned you about a thousand times before you got married to this man, before you got married to this woman. And most of the time, because you were having sex with this person outside of marriage, you were blinded because now scales are on your eyes to anything that God warned you. And anytime somebody got somebody warned you about it, you became offended with them. You got mad at them and then you cut them off because you wanted what you wanted, which was which, which went totally against what God said. So the first thing that you need to do is take full responsibility responsibility for you giving God your butt to kiss because that's what you did. You need to take full responsibility for disrespecting God's, the people that God sent to warn you. You want to repent for, for having scales on your eyes. You know, when you love somebody, it dims your discernment about that person. So because you open up the door, and remember, when you open up a door, you don't get to say what demon comes through that door. When you open up the door to sin and you started having sex with that man or that woman before you got married to them, you immediately couldn't see right, no way. Sex immediately, especially when you get good dick. Sex immediately makes your dick down. That's just what it does. And don't y'all send me no email about me saying the word dick. It is not a bad word. God has not convicted me about that. And I can't say penis dumb because there is no woman on here that's ever been penis dumb in their life. Penis means that you got good sense still. Penis, you can still go to work and you still got your appetite. You know what I'm saying? Like penis, you know, that's like a responsible member. That's like you still 
are mature. You still got your good mind. But when you dick dumb, honey, you ain't got no good mind. So don't send me no email. I could have said it different. I can't say it different because you must have never been dick dumb before. Dick dumb make you lose your mind a little bit. You know what I'm saying? You lose your appetite a little bit. You go a little bit crazy. You turn into a psychopath. You want to just, you know what I'm saying? Somebody look at them. You like, you looking at, like, you better, that's my dick. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm only talking to the people that understand what I'm saying because I done been dick. I haven't been penis dumb. So please don't send me no emails saying that dick, I, I can't listen to your message because I okay, well, don't listen to it because you ain't never been dick dumb before. You don't need deliverance then. I need a deliverance. You know what I'm saying? The only people that need deliverance are the people like me who done been dick now and know what I'm talking about. Whenever you got that kind, you can't see no more. I do. I, I'll marry you. Honey, all sense of senses have left your body. You just, it's gone. You're not making no good godly common sense. That's what happens when you open up the door to sin. That's just what happens. And so you repent for it. You want to renounce it and come out of agreement with it. This kind only come out by prayer and fasting. <laughs> so that's why we're here. And I believe that God will turn your house around through true, genuine repentance, true, genuine renouncing of the covenant you made with Jezebel and Leviathan and you just bombarding heaven for deliverance for your husband or your wife for the enemy that you let through the door because of your disobedience to God. There's always a consequence to sin. The wages of sin are death, even if that means you are now in a miserable marriage with a man you were never supposed to marry in the first place. I do believe, however, that God is full of grace. God is redemptive. And just like the prodigal son, the Bible says he came to himself. I believe that your wife or your husband will come to themselves and turn back to God um, and will get a great testimony of it. How do I know? I think the best example in the Bible we have of a narcissistic man or a man that dealt with the spirit of Leviathan, which is the king of all pride, is Saul before he turned into Paul. How do I know that? When you read the book of Job, the book of Job lets us know that Leviathan is a dragon. And one of the things that keep Leviathan so impenetrable are his scales, right? He's fully scaled up right here, fully scaled up back here, which means that if you try to take a sword and off his head, you can't really do that because he's fully scaled up. And the Bible says that when um, the light shined down on Saul, when God was calling him on the street called straight on the road to Damascus, it said the scales fell off of his eyes and the scales are Leviathan. And so your husband or your wife has scales on their eyes. And if Jesus Christ, there was a man named Ananias, actually, if you read a few chapters before that cried out to God and said, Saul is coming to kill us. Can you help us out? And because of that, God stopped Saul, took the scales off of his eyes. And because of that, he um, worked for God forever until his last days. And so just like the man Ananias in the Bible cried out to God and God answered his prayers, I believe that you will become likened unto a, um, an Ananias for your husband or for your wife. And I believe that God is going to turn them around. I used Saul as an example because I don't believe Neb Nebuchadnezzar uh, stuck with his uh, deliverance. So I wanted to use somebody that we know, you know, stuck with their deliverance until it was good. So we're getting ready to pray really quickly. What about narcissistic parents? You know, um, I'm a big fan of you, you're, you being able to honor people from afar. You know what I'm saying? And so if you find that you have a narcissistic parent and every time you go around them, it's more damaging than it's doing any good. Uh, the Bible says, honor your mother and your father and your days will be long, but it also says provoke not your children to wrath and the next verse and nobody ever reads that part. And so if you know that this is a damaging relationship, I think that you have the ability to honor from afar and just ask God to deliver them so that you can be around them and things of that nature. And so um, let's go ahead and just let's pray for a few moments. And your homework assignment is to study all of the scriptures that I gave, study um, idolatry. And I want you to write out your prayer points and I want you to write out what you need to repent for idolatry for. And for day two of the fast, we will be focusing solely on killing all idols in our life. Because again, if you are uh, getting married, which you are, and you don't ever want to marry a narcissist, your, your reward for narcissist is idolatry. That's it. Your, your reward for idolatry is marrying a narcissist. So let's make sure that we kill all that in the name of Jesus. So let's begin to thank God. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We, we praise your holy name. We magnify you, Father. 
We thank you that people from all over the world have gathered together, Father, to seek your face concerning our lives, concerning our heart. We thank you, God, that people all over the world are coming back to you and reminding ourselves who our first love is. We thank you, Father, for your mercy that allowed us to wake up again at the end of the year. There are so many people that died before this year was out. There are so many people, God, that were hit with tragedy, Father, but you saw fit that you showed us mercy, that we were able to come before you another day and just ask for your forgiveness and your repentance and receive your grace and your mercy, Father. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you, God, for giving us more capacity to receive your love. We thank you, Father, for opening up the door for love for us. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for giving us capacity, God, to even learn how to love other people the right way. We thank you, Father, for turning our stony hearts into a heart of flesh. We thank you for heart circumcision today in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that courses through our body. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that acts as a boundary around our house. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, God, that speaks for us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that silences any accusatory voice against our life. We thank you, God, for the blood of Jesus Christ, the impenetrable the impenetrable blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. And now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we cover ourselves with the full armor of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, as we go into the second day of this fast, Father, we put on the helmet of salvation over us, our children, and our spouses. Father, we put on the helmet of salvation, God, that covers our mind. We put on the breastplate of righteousness that covers our heart and chest cavity. We put our belt of truth on that covers our loins. We put our, uh, our uh, feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Father. Above all, we lift up our shield of faith, which quenches every fiery dart of the enemy. And we have our sword, which is the word of God. Father God, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you that even as we go into the realm of the spirit and tear down evil altars of our father's house, evil altars of our mother's house, we thank you, Father, that any fiery dart that's trying to retaliate against us, the shield of faith quenches it in the name of Jesus Christ and it shall not come nigh us. We thank you, Father, that because we have completely clothed ourselves with the full armor of God, when we go into the realm of the spirit, Father, the enemy will not be able to tell the difference between us and Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the full armor of the, of the full armor of God. We thank you, God, that we are impenetrable against any hit. And we thank you, Father, that the enemy has no legal right to touch us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, we declare, let there be light in every dark place in our life. Let there be light with any hidden covenant or any hidden altar in our life. Let there be light with any hidden idolatry in our hearts, God. Let shine a light on anything that is hiding in our life, even for ourselves. I pray, God, that the light of God shines on any spirit of deception that would keep our eyes closed to whatever is in us that we simply cannot see. Let there be light in our house, God. Let there be light in any friend group that you need to expose and that we need to get rid of. Let there be light to any friend group in our children that needs to go. Let there be light to any friend our spouse house has that is a hindrance and a wall against our marriage from prospering. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that the light of God shines in this fast. Even today, let the spirit of revelation, God, hit us. Let the answer come to us. Let the light of instruction come to us, God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, let nothing fly up under our prophetic radar in this season of our life. In the mighty name of Jesus, let nothing fly, fly under our prophetic radar. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And even right now, Father, we silence every voice of any babies crying out against us from the grave because of abortions. We silence every voice of anybody that was hung on our land, anybody that was murdered by our grandparents or our parents, God, anybody that was murdered, God, and their blood is still crying out against us for vengeance in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We silence that voice with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, you said in your word in Hebrews 12, verse 24, God, that the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. We declare today, God, that the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than the blood of the abortion. The blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than the blood of the murder that took place. The blood of Jesus Christ cancels every curse that the voice of vengeance, God, is trying to lay on us in the name of Jesus. And we declare, Father, we thank you that the blood of Jesus speaks more advantageous 
these things towards us. And we thank you, Father, that you have forgiven us for these murders, that the babies are silenced by the blood of Jesus Christ and taken up to you in peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Father, we repent for all idolatry in the name of Jesus Christ. We repent for making ministry an idol. We repent for making our businesses an idol. We repent, Father, for making work an idol, where we spend more time working, God, than we do spending time with you. Father, we repent for making social media an idol. We repent, Father, for consuming and consuming and consuming and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And there is not a day that we can find that we have spent at least an hour in the word with you for years now. Father, we repent for idol worship in the name of Jesus Christ. We repent, God, in any way that we've made our parents an idol. We repent, God, for where we've made our men and women of God an idol, where we heard you clearly say something, but if they said something different, we listen to them instead of you. God, we repent for making them an idol. We repent, God, for making our church organizations an idol. We repent, God, for making our sororities and fraternities an idol. We repent, God, in the mighty name of Jesus for all idol worship, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. We repent for making um, cancer paraphernalia an idol in the name of Jesus Christ. We repent for making all cancer paraphernalia into idol worship. We repent, Father, in the name of Jesus for making procrastination an idol. Anything that we loved more than obeying you, God, we repent for it now. We repent for making football and basketball and any other sport into idolatry in the name of Jesus Christ. Anything in our house that is idol worship and we don't know about it because we think it's just simple house decor, let there be light in that house. Let there be light, God. Illuminate it so we can throw it away. Okay? Illuminate it so we can anoint it, God, and cancel any curse or any spirit that was attached to it, God, and throw it out of our house according to Acts 19, 19. Spirit of the living God, we repent for all idolatry. We repent for idolatry of marriage in the name of Jesus Christ. We repent for obsessing over marriage where we can't stop thinking about it and it is now turning to worry and it is now turning to fear and it is now turning to anxiety and it is now giving anxiety attacks and it is now turning to covetousness where you're looking at other people's marriages and wondering why not you. Father, we repent for all idol worship. We repent, God, for making the man we were dating an idol. We repent for making the woman we were dating an idol. We repent for it now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We renounce all of these idols, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. We come out of agreement with narcissism. We come out of agreement with the spirit of Leviathan and Jezebel. We come out of agreement, God, with jealousy, envy, covetousness. We come out of agreement with and renounce uh, um, uh, procrastination. And, and I just heard the Lord just even say, you've made pornography and masturbation an idol in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we repent for all sexual immorality. We repent for all sexual perversion in the name of Jesus Christ. And we repent God for making um, pornography, which is sex trafficking into an idol. God, we repent father for being able to orgasm to people who were sold in sex trades, um, and even minors that were sold into the sex trade industry. And now we are now masturbating to these people, God, to these children. In the name of Jesus Christ, we repent, God, for masturbation. And we repent, Father, for pornography in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, continue to repent, continue to renounce. And Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we declare that we give you rule, reign, and dominion over our life over our sexual appetite, over our mind, our will, and our emotion. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you rule, reign, and, and dominion over our emotional appetite, over our marital appetite. We give you rule, reign, and dominion over our ministerial appetite, our business appetite. We give you rule, reign, and dominion over our children, God, over our desires, Father. We give you rule, reign, and dominion over our wombs, God, and men over their regions. We give you rule, reign, and dominion, Father, over our husbands, over our wives. We give you rule, reign, and dominion over our marriages, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ. Let heaven and earth record this day, God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that we are now covenanted with the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross. We are now in covenant with that. Father, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of witnesses 
on this live that come into agreement with all of us. Everybody's in agreement with each other that we are now in agreement with God. Heaven and earth have recorded this day, November the 27th, 2023, that we are now in new covenant with the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are now in the covenant with the blood of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, that we have now been justified because of the blood. And it is now just as I have never done it, just as I have never had idol worship, God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, thank you for the blood that is shed for the remission of our sins, that the remission makes sure that it stops, that there is no, um, there is no, no consequences for these sins because there is a remission that took place in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, we declare that any evil altar cursing our marriages, our finances, our health we declare that it dies now in the name of Jesus Christ anything that gave the legal right any idolatry that gave the enemy legal right to attack us father we cancel it now we tear down every evil altar that is cursing our marriages in the name of Jesus Christ we destroy the spirit of idolatry in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ Father, we declare that the blood of Jesus Christ purifies and cleanses our spirit, soul, and body from every influence of idolatry in the name of Jesus Christ. Let there be light on any hidden thing. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 You can continue on in your prayer as the day goes on. Um, and But, you know, this is going to be good. I'm excited about day two of our fast. Again, we fast from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. And I want you to just kind of pray along to this video. You can fast forward straight to the video, but um, prayer, but just pray from 6 at 6 a.m., 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. And, um, you know, do it that way. So it's going to be a very powerful day. I'm just excited that thousands of people all over the entire globe are coming into repentance with God, really, you know, restoring our relationship with God. And the Bible lets us know in Isaiah 58 that you will be known as the repairer of the breach. And so you are standing in the gap of your bloodline that breached the contract with the enemy. And you will be known as one that repaired the breach of contract with the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. So I'm very excited about it. And you should be too, men and women of God. This is going to be a powerful fast. And, you know, God is good forever. So I want everybody to grab their communion. And I have mine here. I'm a big fan of, you know, breaking this. And I break it to remind myself of the lashing. This represents the body of Jesus Christ. And I break my communion to remind myself of all of the beating that Jesus Christ went through, you know, and the Bible lets us know that he was wounded for my transgression. So every time I take his body and I tear it into pieces, I'm reminded that he was wounded from my transgression. And every time I break this and I tear it into pieces, I'm reminded that he was bruised from my iniquities, right? So if there's any demonic iniquity riding on my DNA, it has to be taken off because he was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisements of his peace was upon us. And with every strike he took, every time his body was torn into pieces with the cat and nine tails, every time his body was torn into pieces, I was healed. And so I like to tear this into pieces because it puts me in remembrance of the damage that was done to his body. And every time I see this not whole again, every time he did this, I was already healed, right? So you take your body for your repentance. You always want to take um, communion at discerning the body with repentance. Obviously, we've been doing that. And so you don't take communion ignorantly. You take it with the knowledge of what Jesus Christ did for you and all of that. So, yes, if you don't have communion cups, please just grab a bottle of water, you know, pray over it, declare that it is the blood of Jesus Christ and all of that. We are taking communion every day for the next 25 days. Yes. And then now we have the blood of Jesus Christ. And whenever the blood was shed on Calvary, it canceled all of the curses. Right. But just like with salvation. OK, you, you can't just in your mind say, well, I'm saved now. No, salvation required you to say it out loud. Salvation required you to make a public declaration that Jesus Christ is now your Lord and Savior. Well, the same thing with the blood. And so what we want to do is declare that it's the blood that breaks all curses. The blood of Jesus Christ is what guarantees that your, the curses over your bloodline is completely broken. Okay? Completely broken. 
So we cancel all witchcraft prayers, all demonic altars, all generational curses, all generational covenants in the name of Jesus Christ, all evil assignments that are against your life, that has been released against your marriage, your health, your body. And we now apply the blood of Jesus Christ to your marriage, to your mind, to your body, and every curse that was assigned, every written curse, every generational curse, every time release curse, every, every curse canceled because of the blood of Jesus Christ. There you have it. So fasting starts at 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. If you want all of the written details of this fast, please go to coveredbygod.co. Again, that is coveredbygod.co. Enter your name and your email address and check your spam folder for your welcome email with all of the details. Okay? Grab some crackers if you need the bread, like grab some saltine crackers, maybe grab a piece of bread, you know what I'm saying? So like that, that should work. You know, so, okay, guys, I love you so much. Um, tomorrow's going to be great. So just make sure that you, you know, stay in mind. Somebody said, do we have to listen to the audio for this prayer? You know, it's good to, it's good to remember, it's good to watch this stuff over again because it retains a lot of the information. So if you are going on your lunch break and you know, you would be rather eating. It's cool to kind of put this in your ear and just kind of walk around the parking lot, get some steps in and just pray while you're doing that. Um, or you can pray your own prayer. That's between you and God. But, you know, that's that's what I do. So I love you guys. And we are praying between the hours of 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. We are fasting. We are abstaining from all food during that time. And uh, if you want all of the information, go to coveredbygod.co, enter your name and email address, and you will get that email to you. Just check your inbox and your spam folder. I love you all to life, and we will talk again tomorrow by the grace of God. Bye.